I, I will try to, to make my, my presentation as concise as possible. Uh, I don't do miracles, so uh, I hope that you, you, you won't uh, hold, hold, hold me for this. Uh, before I start, let me first congratulate Ireland for uh, uh, what the, the, the government just announced a few days ago. I mean, I know that you guys, on the 15th of December, you will not be, you know, hold by any agreement or with the EU, which I believe that, uh, that that's great, which means, which means that the, the economic reforms you have undertaken for the last few years are paying off, and it's always tough to ask uh, everyone in a country to make a lot of efforts. But at the end, when it pays off, then when it pays off, then it was worth it. That's the way I see it. And that's basically what we are doing also in Morocco. Uh, we have been, for more than, than, than a decade now, really engaged in, in many and deep reforms that I will try to highlight in, in my presentation. So allow me to stand up. Because, uh, you know, I'm a bit like the Italians. I, if you hold me, if I can't move, then I won't be able to speak. So, uh, first of all, Mary has talked about Morocco. It's a 32 million uh, population. Uh, it's, uh, you know, just based, well, I believe, in the, in the middle of the world. I mean, everyone can see the world, you know, it's rounded, so everyone can see it as the middle of the world. But we believe we are in the middle of the world. Just you know, in, in the, the gate to Africa, very close to Europe, and I'll, I'll show you a slide where I will highlight more what I'm saying. Very, our neighbor is Spain. We're happy to have to have Spain as a neighbor, since the ambassador is here. So uh, let me make sure that you understand how uh, we value the, uh, the the improved relationship with Spain. Uh, GDP per capita is around 2,200 euros. This is not uh, purchasing power parity, it's just real GDP. Uh, it's around $3,000 uh, growing, but we believe we can do much better. If I take Morocco, uh, we've been really focusing on the economic side, on, because we believe that if you have a strong economy, then you can address the needs of the population. Because we believe that if you have a strong economy, then you are less uh, affected by extremism, you're less affected by, you know, things that can happen uh, in, in the region, and I'll come back to what happened in the Arab Spring later on. Later on. So, uh, in order to make sure that you have a strong economy, you need to have a very stable political environment. To have a very po a stable political environment, you need to make sure that people accept first the regime where they are, or if they don't accept it, then you oppress them and at one point in time, you know, uh, things happen. That's what happened in uh, Egypt, that's what happened in Tunisia. If you take Morocco, uh, Morocco has, is, is a monarchy. In fact, it's the eldest second, is the second eldest kingdom in the world. I don't know who knows which is the eldest kingdom in the world. In fact, it's Denmark. So we are the second eldest kingdom in the world. We have had a monarchy for 12 centuries now. It's a bicameral parliament system. We have two chambers, you know, just the equivalent of the Congress and the Senate. Uh, we call them Chambre des députés, Chambre des conseillers. Uh, they are uh, doing sometimes the same job, but because, for example, all the laws are voted by the, the two chambers. Uh, we have had and I come back to, to, to that new constitution in uh, the end of November, the end of 2011, that, has, that I believe, as an opposition party, is really on par with the most advanced you know, constitutions in the world. Maybe not the most advanced one, but really on par with many, many developed countries in the world. So uh, the, we have in Morocco a multi-party system. And believe it or not, we have more than 85,000 NGOs in Morocco. And the 85,000 NGOs are working in so many fields. They're working for, to protect the child, to fight for you know, human rights, to fight for women's rights, to, uh, against poverty, against whatever you believe. I mean, 85,000 is a lot. It's a big number. The other thing that, as I said, 
constitution came and really guaranteed the human rights, the, the uh, separation between the, the powers, and that was a big, big issue because if the executive power has also the judicial power, then who makes the arbitra uh, you know, arbitration at one point in time? So we, we made sure that we now have really those uh, significant elements in the Constitution. Of course, after that, and we can talk about it in, in the discussion, you know, voting a law is not applying a law. And uh, then we have to make sure that the spirit of the Constitution is really applied. You know, through what we call the organic laws, but also through the, the daily uh, practice. And uh, when, if you ask me, I say the jury is still out. So we'll see what will happen. But this, uh, you know, the, the, the vote of the Constitution is really, really an end result of a process that started many years ago. And that's, that's why I have this chart, just to make you understand that it's really democratic and social transition that has happened since 1998. What happened in 1998, I mean, King Hassan, who is the father, late King Hassan is the father of Mohammed VI, uh, asked the opposition parties to come and govern the country and, and enter the government. My party was one of those. In fact, I'm, I'm from a party that uh, fought the Hassan regime for 40 years. In fact, I'm a party from, you know, who's constituted at one point in time by Mehdi bin Barka. I'm sure that this name, you know, round, rings a bell in many heads. We still don't know where Mehdi bin Barka, how he was killed and where he was buried. So we're still asking for that. But so, but 1998, I believe that was a change. That was a shift. Hassan II understood that he had to make sure that when he's not here anymore, or you know, when he dies, then a succession can happen, smooth transition can happen. And I believe that really was one of the motives where he 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 called the, the government, the, the opposition parties to come. So back in 1998, they came, and they everyone really played you know, the, its role in, in that partition in, in a good way, in a good sense. Because then in 2000, when Hassan II disappeared, when he died, then when King Mohammed VI came, there was smooth transition. Morocco didn't go into turmoil. And uh, to give to Caesar what, is to, what belongs to, to the king, what belongs to the king, when he came, I believe that he started a process that brought us here today, you know, a peaceful country, no turmoil. Arab Spring didn't affect us that much, and that explains. I give more details about that. But you can see in this in, in, in this chart what he did in the last ten years. I mean, of course, he didn't that he didn't do that alone. I mean, parties were involved, NGOs were involved. Sometimes good pressure, sometimes you know, strong pressure. But at the end of the day, it, it's working. And if you just, uh, I highlighted a few things in, in, in red because this is the ones that I want to talk about. For example, back in 2004, you know, there is, sorry, back in 2004, the laser is not working, the, 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 the instance for equity and reconciliation, the IER. What was this instance? This is exactly the same thing, process that happened in, in South, uh, South Africa, the apartheid thing, where basically they had this. this Neutral commission going and understanding what happened. King Mohammed VI asked the, 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 asked the NGOs, you know, personal personality individuals to constitute this IER, and they went through all the country talking with people who were really hurt by the regime and how to compensate them, and, and mostly well, how this cannot happen again. because. Uh, we had what we call les années de plomb, which is, you know, our worst days, you know, uh, in Morocco between the seven, between, you know, early 70s to, to, eight, to, to late 90s, where basically opposition parties, might, for example, fought the regime, many people disappeared, many people were, uh, went to prison, to jail, many people were killed. So we had these fights between the opposition parties and the regime at that time. So King Mohammed VI came and he was very courageous to do that because basically that was under his father, you know, 
uh, supervision or under his father ruling that those things happened. But the process went on. And I believe that this process allowed us to turn the page, I mean, to move into the future, not stay you know, in the past and still you know, fighting for, for, for those things. There are still some files that have to be uh, completely cleared. I mean, Medibun Bakar's file is one of them. But at least it was very good, well done. 2004, also, the free trade agreement with Europe. Then after that, we, we also had the free trade agreement with the US. So Morocco it has a free trade agreement with the U Europe, free trade agreement with the US, and even an advanced status with the US, with the, with the Europe. So which basically, I believe we are the only country that has these three things. Uh, the family code, Mudawana, that's, this is, again, a very courageous action from the king, where basically we uh, modernized the family code, where basically the, the women rights were granted. Still, more things to do, but I believe that was a big jump, uh, and, and, and that was, I'm saying, very courageous, because that was, if you have a religious interpretation coming from one of the, the books, then it's very hard to, to make people understand they should change. So that was, he had to put all his weight into the balance to make that family code much better and to protect women's rights. The uh, National Initiative for Human Development, this is basically where we decided to have a poverty map in Morocco and to target the most vulnerable <coughs> you know, uh, parts of the population. And today we are bringing all the, the, I mean, a lot of, of help to, to those regions and we are moving now to create projects that will generate revenues for them. Not just give them fish, but also you know, how to fish. So that's basically what we are doing. And 2008, we had this central instance for prevention of corruption. We have also our problems in there. We are trying to move now this central uh, uh, instance for, you know, has been changed to the Council for, uh, against, Prevention, uh, against Corruption in the new constitution. And in 2011, it was a very interesting thing happening, which is the, basically we decided, and then King Mohammed VI again was one promoting it, to go to uh, regionalization, where basically Morocco will be split into regions, and all those regions will have certain autonomy, will have power to move forward. So maybe we'll not go as extreme as you know the Spanish model, but we'll be between. Uh, basically, we studied Spain, we studied Turkey, we studied what happened in France, and we'll have something uh, uh, Germany. Also, so we'll have something that that is a mixture of, of, of these different models. In here, we also pointed <coughs> to uh, special status for our southern provinces, which is called like the Western Sahara. We call it our southern provinces where basically we're saying we're going to go for an extended autonomy in, those, in, this, in that region, more than in the other regions, where basically they will have their own judicial, executive, parliamentary system. They can, you know, allow, allocate resources to the, to the economic development of the region, but they will be, of course, under the Moroccan sovereignty. So that's, and that was our proposal to the United Nations, to try to, to, to solve that problem that we inherited from the colonization back in the 50s. So that's basically, and of course, as I told you, 2011, new constitution. Everything has, all this process, I believe, has helped us uh, avoid the trouble, the turmoil that happened in, in the other countries in the region. And if you allow me to summarize it, in three main reasons why that, uh, that the Arab Spring didn't have the same effect. I will tell you first, because there is a real bound between Moroccan people and the monarchy. I told you 12 centuries of monarchy. I also need to tell you that when King Mohammed V came and the French were colonizing with the, with the Spanish part of, of the Morocco, they proposed to King Mohammed V to govern under their supervision, he refused. So they uh, exiled him to Madagascar at that time. 
So that created a really strong bond between the Moroccan people and, and the monarchy. The second reason <laughs> under this, this chapter is really about King Mohammed VI when he came, as I told you, he was very close to, to, to the people and he launched so many reforms. So the, 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 there is a legitimacy of the, of the, of the, of the rule, rule ruler, not what hap- as what happened in, in, in Egypt or what happened in, in, uh, in, in Tunisia. The second reason has to do with the role that the political parties play. My, my, my party, for example, as I told you, we had these fights with the regime. So our Arab Spring happened years before. And it was not in the streets and the, you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the, the form of protest, but it was really fighting for human rights, fighting for freedom of speech, fighting for freedom of association, fighting for four, 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 four. And that's how I told you so many things happened, you know, so uh, people sent to jail, killed, and, and so on and so forth. So we had those spaces of freedom, not what, as what happened in other countries. And the third reason, the NGOs. 85,000 NGOs being very close to the people, canalizing anger. Because at one point in time, even political party like mine, when he entered government, then we were not as close as before with the people of Morocco. So that is really so. That's the main reason why the 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 the, 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 the Arab Spring didn't have the same effect. And this is how you know you can see all those uh, testimonials from. Clinton to the president of Tunisia to CNN and on, uh, and I, I like also the uh, uh, special ambassador for, for the European Integration Project, Mrs. Zapatero, also was very uh, uh, eloquent talking about you know stability in Morocco reforms and so on and so forth. So let me move now to the economic part. As I told you. Uh, if, and this is really what it's a, I would call it the four leg type of project where basically you have to work on the social things, you have to work on the political you know, aspect, you have to work on, 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 on the uh, demo- trade on, 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 on the economic aspect. And if you take the economy, we're saying in order to create growth, then Let's start with the right foundations. Foundations in the economy are really the macroeconomic drivers, macroeconomic fundamentals. And you can see here that the Morocco growth, the GDP growth has been averaging 4.8% since 2001. In 2013, we will finish around 4.2%. So it will decrease a little bit our, our average, but very slowly. And the, the, we have a finance law that we, we just has been discussed being presented today, so I'll have to head back tonight to Morocco, to because I'm that finance commission, where we are pro- they are projecting for next year 4.5 percent. So uh, we are in, in this range between you know four and five percent for the last you know 10 years. Inflation has really been subdued with 1.7 percent. Uh, it's uh, I believe now it's not really strong point in. in in, in the, I would call it advanced world, where basically a lot has been done to fight inflation. There's another thing that is very important for us, which is the FDI growth. For our balance of payments, we really need to attract foreign direct investment. And I know that Ireland has been you know, doing great in, in this area. Uh, it's, uh, I believe, before the crisis, Ireland has been the most a successful country in Europe attracting the likes of you know HP, uh, Microsoft, uh, Bombardier and so on and so forth. So at one point in time we have been a little bit competing against you guys. When I was Minister of Finance, oh, I am Minister of Industry and in charge of foreign direct investment. I'm sure I, I met some investors that had the choice to go into Ireland or going to Morocco because the Morocco is the next frontier. North Africa became, became, uh, started to be the next frontier. Uh, Eastern Europe started to, to fade away because once they got into the European Union, they had inflation in salaries, they had mobility happening. So we were really fighting hard. And in fact, we were competing more with Tunisia and Egypt, to be honest, than with Ireland. But we had some, sometimes, for example, Bombardier had a manufacturing plant here. And I was, when I was discussing with them, they had the choice of going into different countries, 
extending uh, their, their plan here or coming to Morocco. So we won that case. We lost others, but uh, we won that case. Uh, and employment rate uh, also has been decreasing 8.7%. So all this has made us, uh, you know, the Financial Times, the FDI made us the African country of the future 2001-2012, where basically we were the first country uh, in Africa for, for foreign investment. And uh, Fitch maintained its investment grade in 2012. The IMF recognized our efforts. And really, it's hard, hard work, really hard work to make sure, make sure that, that you maintain the, the budget deficit <coughs> under control. And at the same time, you create enough economic activity to, to, to keep that GDP growth. The, uh, the second, uh, so, so, so the foundations of the, the house are really that, that macroeconomic fundamentals. Then we said, what are the growth engines? Basically, and the growth engines, we decided to be more active as government, not just, for example, if you go and you talk with the World Bank, they will tell you, well, just make the business climate right, just have the fundamentals right, and the entrepreneurs will decide on where to invest, basically. That's the, that, that's the economic theory. We decided that as government to be more voluntarist and to promote really the sectors where we believe Morocco has a competitive advantage. So this is how, for example, I was in charge of the emergence pact in, in the industry, where basically we defined what we call the métier mondial du Maroc, which is the global you know, sectors, Morocco global sectors, where we can compete. And we said, well, that's automotive, that's uh, aeronautics, that's offshoring, uh, that's agro-industry, and so on and so forth. And we started looking at the world as north and south mainly. It's not a not lot, I mean, not going east to Middle East, but really being, you know, and the, I used to say that Morocco can be for Europe what Mexico is for the US, basically. That's the idea. But also a gate for Africa. And this is where I believe we can do a lot with Irish companies. Because, and, uh, and I come back to that point when I'm, I'm going to talk about Africa. Then, so, we said industries is definitely a sector that we can develop. Uh, Digital Morocco 2013, where, you, you know, you bring IT into your processes to make them more competitive, but also you build companies that can go and export. This is what you have done in, in, in Ireland. The uh, other uh, sectors, logistics, and we, we are doing a lot because logistics is part of you, you know, the competitiveness of any uh, industry. We're doing a lot also in tourism. Morocco has been, we talked with Mary, with Mary about China. we also tapping into these new countries uh, with high potential for, for tourism. The uh, agriculture where, I know that Ireland is also very strong in agriculture here, we're saying uh, Morocco has big potential and basically like just to, 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 to make you understand what we've, we've done, if you take in the industry of, or if we take agriculture, we really thought, uh, we went through a process like as any other company would do it, I mean the multinational. So in fact we brought McKinsey and we told them, well listen, Morocco Inc. wants to compete in industry. Which industry should we compete? In which country should we compete? So, they went, they scanned in you know, 70 sectors, and this is how we came up with that seven or eight, uh, you know, Morocco global sectors. Agro-industry, textile, are the, 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 and the, the others, as I told you, offshoring, electronics, and, and so on and so forth. In, in agriculture, we did the same thing. So at the end, we said, well, there, there must be two pillars for the agriculture. One pillar is what we call productive or, or intensive agriculture, where basically you will find the, the big landowners, working on, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, tree uh, production like olive oil or, 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 you know, oranges and so on and so forth. Or, and you'll find the second pillar, which is the uh, solid, uh, you know, uh, solidarity, solidarity, which is the, uh, uh, that targets the, 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 the small farmers and how we can help them, you know, develop, they, they, they uh, earn more in, in managing the, the small piece of land. So just to make you understand that 
some, we have this always this concern about the social, you know, aspect, uh, in, 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 you know, in, in, in the picture. So fishing, we had this plan called Aliotis, where I believe Morocco can be one of the biggest players. And I'm happy that we are moving positively with this uh, uh, agreement on 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 on, the, on, the, on the fishing with Europe that would benefit, you know, first the Spanish uh, fisheries. Uh, the com I mean, commerce trade was part of, you know, our, our idea. We have now the, the, one of the biggest malls, if not the biggest mall in Africa. Uh, this is where Casablanca can play the role Dubai is playing, for example. That's, that's something that we are working on. The housing, where we believe that if you want to stabilize a country, then give everyone a house. So to give everyone a house, I mean, you're not, you don't give it, but you make it affordable. This is why social housing is such an important pro I mean, aspect in what we do, is how today we have managed, and really that's a very interesting uh, you know, uh, experience. We have managed to create what we call champions, local champions. Two or three companies that really do the social housing now, they are doing it in Guinea, they are doing it in uh, Senegal, they are doing it in other... African countries. Solar plan, we are very big on, on, on uh, renewables. Basically, we said that by 2020, we should have 42% of our mix, energy mix, should be renewable energy. And in fact, that 42% uh, uh, is 14% hydraulic, 14% wind, and 14% solar. And it's around 2,000 megawatts solar that will be installed in, by 2020. We have started uh, last year with 150 megawatts. One of the Spanish companies won was part of, of the uh, I mean conglomerate that won that, that, uh, that, that tender. And fa finance, Casablanca finan Finance City, we're basically we're building you know, a hub, financial hub in Casablanca to be the gateway between what's happening in Europe and what's happening in Africa. Basically, that's, that's the ambition. So, the growth engines, as I told you, I mean the foundations, the growth engines, now the infrastructure is another aspect of the puzzle. You, infrastructure is playing two roles. One, it's a sector by itself, so it creates jobs. I mean, if when you are building a you know, road, you're, you're creating jobs. But at the same time, it's uh, uh, an enabler for all those strategies that I talked about. Because if you have a freeway that goes north to south, east to west, then you can have access to different regions where you have a talent pool, where you have you know, labor force more easily, and then, then uh, it's happening. So basically, the, 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 the one, the, the major undertaking that we have done is the Casablanca, is the Tangiers Med port. Tangiers Med port, just to give you a sense, is when it will be, the second part will be finished, you know, two, three years time, it will be 8.5 million companies a year. It's as big as Rotterdam. It will be bigger than Marseille. So just for you to understand. And uh, the, uh, it's thanks to Tangiers Med that we won uh, the, uh, that we convinced Renault to come and build that, that plant in, in, ten, in Tangiers. Uh, this is one of the largest plants of automotive outside uh, you know, France. We're building tramways, we're building TGV. I'm not very convinced about the TGV thing. <laughs> but what the heck, I mean, sometimes there are decisions that are taken that are not discussed enough. Uh, the 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 uh, we'll see. I mean, I was reading yesterday in, in one of the newspapers that the, the SNCF, which sells the TGV, is being challenged, uh, you know, by their TGV operations. So I hope that this is not what we're going to see in one of our newspapers, you know, ten years down the road. That's that's a question mark. Um, let's talk a little bit about the the the. the, the the, the value proposition. Basically, this is this is a, a real picture. You can see by by sunny day, you can see how close we are to to Tarifa or, or to Spain. So we are 14 kilometers from Spain. So I used to say 
uh, we are uh, the least expensive European country. <laughs> we have not, uh, you know, acted that in in the United Nations yet, but that's uh, something. And and uh, uh, it's closer. The ambassador will agree with me. It's closer to go uh, to. Uh, all the south of Spain from Tangiers than from Madrid, basically. So it's an hour, it's an hour, it's an hour uh, trip. And basically you can put anything on a truck in Tangiers and reach the eastern part of, or the northern part of France in 48 hours. So if you are working in a, in a factory, then you're, you're, you, sh you put it on a Friday when you're workforce goes for the weekend, they come back on a Monday, it's on the assembly lines. That's really the, the value proposition that we are saying. And of course, I mean, I'm not going to talk about numbers, but uh, well, I will talk about numbers later, later on. The other thing, as I told you, we, we believe that we are in the center of the world because you are one hour from Madrid, you are two hours from Paris, you are three hours from Frankfurt, uh, you are seven hours from New York, and so on and so forth. And, you're really well located. The other thing is, look at this. <coughs> Sorry. What happened is all all these connections. When we built the, the Tangiers Medport, it allowed us to make so much connections with the other parts of the world because we needed a large port to, to do that. And of course, we are competing against uh, with Algeciras on, on on that port. But that's that's the way it is. And and you look when you're looking at the uh, ranking, uh, in, what, what you, they have an index that is the uh, logistics index that measures competitiveness. We moved from the 83rd, you know, 83rd uh, rank in 2005 to 18, you know, in 2011, which means that it has really brought us possibility to go to all those African countries, for example, or to European countries, or to Asia, thanks to Tangier's Men. And this is where I, I'm going to come back to that point when I talked about Irish companies. We believe that we can, if Irish entrepreneurs are really keen going on, on going to Africa, then they can, one of the best way of doing it is coming, is teaming up with Moroccan you know, companies. Because of this, but because of course our political position in Africa. I mean, the king has been very active uh, making, uh, building strong uh, relationship with many African countries. And African countries have very good opinion of us. They, they are very friendly. They don't see, see us at this point in time. Maybe that, that image will change at the end, you know, years down the road. But they don't see us as the old uh, uh, colonizer, I mean, the, the, the old, uh, you know, uh, colonizing country. Uh, they see us as more advanced, but <coughs> in some areas, but, you know, they can build green partnerships. So, at this point in time, we, the Irish companies can benefit from this. This is just to uh, show you again how well connected we are today. If you take the traffic of Casablanca, believe it or not, but more than 30% of that traffic is uh, linked to traffic connecting to Africa. So which means that we are really constituting a hub in Casablanca. And we have more than 24 cities uh, connected directly from Casablanca, either in Africa or in the Middle East. This is just to, to show you that we, are, we have tried to, to, to be very competitive and will continue to do that. I mean, compared to, of course, I mean, other countries have their own challenges. I mean, I, I'm not going to compare the salary uh, in Morocco to Spain because the cost of living or the standard of living is different. But then the Spanish entrepreneurs haven't sued that because now they are one of the best, one of the, the most, uh, Spain is, is one of the largest investors in Morocco. And in fact, last year, this is the first year where our exchange trade with, with Spain has become the, the number one for us and for you guys. I mean, uh, uh, overtaking France. The French were not very happy about that. So this is really what's, what's happening in, 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 in that part of the world. But then it, these costs allow us to compete with Turkey, allows us to compete 
with Romania, allow us to compete with you know, Tunisia and, and, and Egypt. Although Tunisia and Egypt today have their own challenges that has not, have nothing to do with the economy. And, and that's why, coming back to my first point, political stability is the first thing that investors will look, like, will look at. Otherwise, there is no return on investment, I mean, if you don't have, if not sure that there will be an investment after a few years. So, uh, the other thing that is very interesting is the free trade agreements that we have signed. Uh, we have signed more than 41 free trade agreements because when you take Europe, you don't count it as one. I mean, every uh, parliament has to uh, ratify it. So we have 41 uh, uh, free trade agreements. If you take that 41 free trade agreement, then it's what, around 1.2 billion customers that you can access uh, to, uh, with, uh, to, uh, from Morocco with a custom fee exemption. That's really what is this, this chart is showing. Agreement with the United States of America, agreement with Turkey, we have an agreement with the European Union, we have the agreement with our countries, we have an agreement and the negotiation with uh, you know, the West African countries, and uh, this is why, and also we have this advanced strategy with EU. Because if an investor comes in a country, then he needs to have access to, to, to markets uh, at duty free. That's really what, what we have been doing. Sometimes it was really tough for our industries. I mean, some industries in Morocco disappeared because they had competition from, from Spanish companies, or they had competition from Turkish companies, or they had competition from United Arab. Uh, Emirates are, you know, co companies. But at the end of the day, when, when I was industry minister, the people would come and complain and say, well, that's what Schumpeter has said. There will be creative destruction, <coughs> which will mean that some sectors will disappear, others will be created. That's really what happened. So, for example, in ceramics, right, where the Spanish people have been very strong, we have been really suffering. So there are only few players left. Uh, we cannot talk about sector. But in automotive, we have had so much gain. So that's really what's happening. Uh, of course, all this cannot work if you don't have the, the people. And people, we have been really focusing on building universities, on uh, encouraging private sectors. We are challenged, let me tell you that. I mean, although we believe that we can, we have the capacity today to have 10,000 engineers graduating a year, at the secondary level, we are challenged. Our level in education has really decreased over time. And uh, this is one of the, the most, I, I believe if we have to do only one thing in Morocco, then we should you know, do this. Because, uh, I mean, any country should do this. I mean, focus just on, on education. And I, I understand that when the, the crisis hit Ireland, the government has decided to see focus just on education and, and on infrastructure, which is an interesting thing to do. I'm very happy today because uh, I have my colleagues from the University of Al Akhawain, which is the, one of the largest private universities. I mean, it's, it's, there are still uh, some subsidies from, from, from the government, but uh, it's, uh, it's an English speaking university. <coughs> and they, are, they came here to meet with the Trinity College and with another university here. So the aim is to have more links on the education side. With, with Ireland, which I believe is going to benefit both countries. Our youth are very open to the world. In fact, more than 13 million users, <coughs> internet users, and more than 4.1 million Facebook users, which is the 39th uh, rank in the world. I mean, this is driving me crazy with my daughter, let me tell you that. <laughs> and sometimes, I, I, as, as Mary mentioned, I, I worked for Microsoft for 11 years. So we were promoting ICT and I, the use of IT technology, the, the computer as an extension of the brain, just like you know, the, the, the tractor was an extension of the human force. But sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm questioning, I have hard questions about the use of IT. I mean, if you have all these kids going and just chatting the whole day, what the heck, maybe it's not the best use. So, uh, but anyway, that's a new word, and, and, and we, we are embracing it. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to finish. Just to tell you, this is not just to let you know that you know, once you have done all this job and you want the investors to come, then you have, put, you, have to need, you have to have some packages to offer them. 
Just like you guys, for example, you decide that the copper tax should be much lower than the rest of Europe, we have done the same thing. And we have free zones where basically, just to give you an idea, free zone, an investor will come, he will pay zero, I mean, of course, if he used the free zone to export, he will pay no corporate tax for the first five years, then they will, put, they will pay 8.75% tax, corporate tax, over the, the next 20 years. So which is very unbeatable type of, of, of uh, proposition. We have fund, has the second fund that will help subsidize part of your investment, of course, up to a limit, but 10%, basically, that's what we pay. For few sectors, the sectors that we want to encourage, then we will have that. Otherwise, we will not have it. In tourism, also, we, we're doing things, and of course, for Casablanca Finan Finance City. These are the free zones where basically, for example, in Tangier Free Zone, a lot of your, a uh, lot of sp Spanish people work in, in that Tangier Free Zone. This is how I learned my few words in Spanish. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, and finally, we have also an agency, just the one that you have here that have been very successful to make sure that we have someone to talk to if you go and you want to be an investor. And that I'm very happy to, to tell you that I was the one who created this. In fact, all of them. No, not all of them. Dubai was not created at that time. But here we are, this one. I'm looking for it. The United Kingdom one in London. So we have, you know, a, a, a representation in, in London. But thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I hope that uh, you know enjoyed the, the, the presentation.